Finding myself at a loss for words, and the funny thing is, it's okay. Word of God, speak. We hear the expression word of God and we recognize what it means the Bible. And can the Bible speak, literally speak? We see Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the division of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and is the discerner of the thoughts and the heart and the intents of the heart. Living scripture can indeed speak to you. As the Word of God discerns your thoughts and heart, it will shape your life in godliness if you allow it. Word of God speak. It's an amazing thing to think that the very creator of the universe would actually speak to you personally. That's staggering. And perhaps the most startling proclamation of the Bible is that God will indeed do just that, speak to you, lead you, guide you. I mean, what a wonder that is when in reality. We should never walk in casualness about that. Word of God speak. Of course, it means the Bible, but the Word of God also refers, we know, to Jesus. The Word of God is Jesus. John 1, 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. One day Jesus was uh, in the temple and surrounded by a bunch of non-believing Jews one day. Jesus made a proclamation to those that believed. And he said this in John 10, 27, My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. <laughs> Word of God, speak. Mercy me, me, mercy me sings, The last thing I need is to be heard but to hear what you would say, to be still and know that you're in this place. Please let me stay and rest in your holiness. Word of God, speak. In 2001, the band Mercy B, Christian band Mercy Me, exploded into popularity with their hit song, I Can Only Imagine. They actually made a movie about it. We saw it. It was really a pretty good movie. And with that hit song came endless concerts and touring and, and just this explosion and the expectations to produce another album. And touring and working on this album at the same time began to take a toll. And Bart Millard of the Mercy Me speaks of this time. He speaks of his exhaustion and his frustration. And he says, after a concert one evening, he said, I went to bed just really frustrated. It started feeling like everything I was saying was the same. I just thought I have nothing else to say, so I went to bed with that on my mind. About 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, he wakes up suddenly, and grabbing his journal, his journal, he began to write this. 
I'm finding myself at a loss for words. The funny thing is, it's okay. The last thing I need is to be heard, but to hear what you would say. Word of God, speak, would you pour down like rain, washing my eyes to see your majesty. Wrote that in his journal and set it aside and went back to sleep. Several weeks later, they're trying to finish their album, and they're working late one night, and the producer says, we need one more song for the album, and they're struggling to come up with what they could have. So Bart pulls out his things and starts looking around, and he comes across his journal, and he reads words that seem vaguely familiar, that he penned it in his sleep practically in the middle of the night. And moved by the words, Bart and his producer finish the song, Word of God Speak. The last thing I need is to be heard, but to hear what you would say. And the thought to be still and know that you're in this place. Please let me stay and rest in your holiness. What a thought. Word of God speak. I think there's times when we need just that. To be still and know that God is in our place. Our place where we need him. And that he will speak to us both personally and corporately as a church. We're encouraged in Psalm 46.10. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nation. I will be exalted in the earth. Be still and know that I am God. Some translations say stop fighting and know what I'm God. The ampli- Amplified says step out of the traffic <laughs> and listen and know that I'm God. All too often that be still part is the hardest part. There's an old expression, I think I've used it over the years, but I've heard other people say it. I have this convention going on in my head. I got all this stuff running around up there. Life gets challenging, confusing, and our minds just take off. We have this convention going on, and the more we listen to it, the more confused we get. And if we listened, Really listen instead of what God would say. The last thing I needed to be heard, what do you have to say about this, Lord? I think we'd hear him say, be still. Quiet your mind and know that I'm God. There's a discipline that would benefit every follower of Christ. The discipline of getting before God, seeking his wisdom for the situation, and being still before him, trusting he will lead you, trusting he will impart his wisdom to you. For as many years as I can remember, I've said most of our prayers are given God advice. <laughs> and we give him a lot, and we go over and over, and we think we haven't heard from him, we give him some more, and we keep talking about it. It takes discipline to quiet your mind before God, to shut off that convention in your head, and seek God for his wisdom. It takes discipline to quiet your mind, shut off this convention in your head, and seek God for his wisdom. All too often, we run headlong into some kind of challenge and trying to make sense of it ourselves. And when we do that, Scripture speaks of that man, Proverbs 26, 12. You see a man wise in his own eyes, there is more hope for a fool than for him. When we're trying to figure out something all on ourselves. We've got this. We're trying to be wise in our own eyes. The Bible says there's more hope for a fool. And the biblical definition of a fool is basically someone who disregards God's word. And the Bible lists many characteristics of such a person, often contrasting him with one who is wise. The Bible says the fool is unrighteous. The fool hates what is holy and righteous and good and loves evil. The fool is unwise, does not seek wisdom, and would reject wisdom if he could acquire it. The Bible says that the person who thinks he has it all figured out, the person that does not seek God and God's wisdom, there's more hope for a fool than for him. If you were with us last week, you remember we began looking at God's wisdom and his promise regarding it. Picked it up in James 1, verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, like about daily, right? If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. 
But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For not, let not that man suppose or receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. We looked at that last week. And we saw that God's wisdom is indeed available to us, but we need to trust him for it without doubting. And there again is that struggle. And Scripture says that the doubter is tossed back and forth, up and down, and becomes unstable. And that word unstable is really quite a word. I mean, it's unstable, un twisted and confused in all his ways and becomes confused. We've called it a seasick Christian. We also saw that Scripture clarifies the difference between earthly wisdom, our own mind, our own thinking, and at times demonic wisdom, and godly wisdom. James three thirteen. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not sin from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. For envy and self-seeking exist confusion and every evil thing are there. What a door to open up to the evil one. And as we study these verses, we saw that God's wisdom, divine wisdom, brings with it not only much-needed wisdom, but divine peace as well. We can walk out in peace. And without doubt, we need wisdom on a daily basis. We need God's wisdom in everyday life's events, and we certainly need his wisdom when faced with life's important decisions. And the good news is that God promises wisdom when we turn to him in faith, believing. And we'll never know when we'll be called on to make important, most important decision of our lives. So how much more important it is to develop seeking God and for his wisdom every day? So when that significant issue comes along, you already know how to hear God's voice. You know how to listen and hear his wisdom. And we saw that wisdom is far more than knowledge. Wisdom is the proper application of knowledge. I think if any of us would survey our life and look back at our choices, many of them good, some of them bad, we'd find out that there were many times where we just blew it. That was goofy. Why did we do that? It seemed like good at the time. The show's been out for a number of years. Some of you have probably seen I like watching. It's called American Pickers. These guys go around all over the country, and they buy other people's junk stuff. They call it uh, rusty gold or something like that. And the guy became very wealthy just selling it, sets it up in a store, and people come out. He finds them in the barns. And I remember one time I was watching, he said, whenever we get a, muse- get a chance to pick a museum, we jump on it. He said, every museum has a room full of mistakes. Things they bought at the time that seemed like a good idea, was going to be well, health profitable, and just didn't work out. When we look back on our lives, we see a room full of mistakes. And if we're not hard enough on ourselves about it, the devil comes along and reminds us about it, causing doubt to rush in. I'm never going to get this. I'm never going to hear from God. Look what I did over there, and I thought that was the right thing to do. And have you ever noticed, even though we've had past mistakes and we bring them up or the devil does, have you never noticed God's not in the habit of bringing them up? In fact, if you listen carefully to God's word, he's either telling you what you are now in Christ or what you can be if you allow him. Because God looks forward. And we should do the same, look forward. We learn from our past mistakes. We look back only to learn from mistakes and not to do it again, but look forward, looking forward, leaning on God's promise of his wisdom. Seek God's knowledge and his wisdom and how to apply it. We learn that knowledge can be memorized, but wisdom must think things through. Wisdom enables us to use knowledge correctly. We can just memorize knowledge, but wisdom, we've got to think about it. And the Bible informs us a great place to start. Proverbs 1, 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools, fools despise wisdom and instruction. There's that fool again despising wisdom and instruction. Don't tell me what to do. I know better than anybody else. 
And the fear of God here can be understood as a holy reverence. Over the years, I've studied the fear of God. It's actually a fascinating study. I mean, there's, there's a fear and trembling of who God is. And even as a believer, I have a fear of walking away from him. And, but it's also understood of a holy reverence of who he is, not this super casual attitude. It's the fool, the unwise, who has no fear of God. Those who behave as they choose to do so without any consideration of God, who he is and what he desires. And for the believer, there's a tension, if you will. The Bible says, fear not, be at peace. We've been not been given a spirit of fear, and yet commands us to fear God. Wait a minute. Fear not, you've not been given a spirit of fear, be at peace, but fear God. There's a tension. And I, I, I think I have a key to understanding that, under, that whole thing there. To not fear someone or something is to say you're equal to it or better than it. I'm not afraid of him or her or that or this, because I, I can handle it. I'm never going to be equal to or better than God. Not remotely. And, and fear of the Lord is recognizing his awesome majesty, his sovereignty. And the Bible says that when you begin to do that, it's the beginning of knowledge. It's just the starting point. The starting point of where he wants to take you. Proverbs 2, 1, following. My son, if you receive my words and treasure my commands within you, so that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding, yes, if you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding, if you seek her as silver and search for her as hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God, for the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. I hope you notice a process here. First, you seek after, you hunger for God's wisdom, for his discernment, for his understanding. And then in the process, you begin to understand the fear of the Lord, maybe because you begin to see how wise he is and majestic he is. And the Bible says you begin to understand the fear of the Lord. And it also says you find the knowledge of God. Well, what kind of knowledge has God got? You might be able to acquire, just as an illustration, please, all the knowledge I have. That won't get you real far, to be honest about it. But what if you had God's knowledge? Wow. The Bible says you can find the knowledge of God. And verse 6 is a fundamental key in you growing God's wisdom. It says, for the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth, speaking, word of God speak, come knowledge and understanding. God gives wisdom. He is the source. I know I've said this many times, but all that man has ever accomplished is because of God's wisdom. Whether they're willing to admit it or not, God is the ultimate source of wisdom. Everything we've ever done. Proverbs 3.19. The Lord's wisdom founded the earth. His understanding established all the universe in space. Deep fountains of the earth were broken up by his knowledge, and the skies poured down rain. Man's advances and everything, and it's considerable. Is really God allowing them to understand in a small part how he put together things in the first place? All that you've ever accomplished, achieved, is a direct result of the gifting of God. And you might argue with that, you know, we have this understanding of gifted. We think of gifted, we think of a gifted child or an individual who's practically gifted. A gifted surgeon, if I'm having an operation, I want that man to be gifted, right? Not just knowledgeable. I, didn't, I don't care if he passed med school. I want to know he's gifted in it. Gifted musician. Perhaps somebody that's gifted worth getting in their hands. And, you know, the Bible, the Old Testament makes it called out. The Old Testament called out specific, specific gifts. I just talk about that word every time. In building the temple. 
Exodus 36 says, make it clear that God gifted these individuals. And so we think they're gifted. They're special, man. They got this gift. Whew. The scripture is clear. We're all gifted one way or another. That's the truth. Now, clearly, there are individuals that excel in certain areas, the very best to take those areas and sincerely apply themselves to it. The athlete, the musicians who practices constantly, craftsmen who studies his trade and skills needed, always striving for more excellence. And regardless of what you do, the ability to accomplish that is a gift from God. If you've applied yourself diligently and growing in your area of gifting, wonderful. We should. We'll be accountable for our gifting. We should practice and apply it. But that doesn't change the fact that the ability is a gift from God, your creator. Not to acknowledge that is pride or arrogance. Acknowledging God as your source of all is wisdom, the beginning of wisdom. And the pursuit, the pursuit of God's wisdom is a very good thing. There's a strong encouragement in Proverbs for us to pursue God's wisdom. Proverbs 4, 5, and 6, get wisdom, get understanding. Do not forget my words or swear from them. Do not forsake wisdom and she will protect you. Love her and she'll watch over you. Proverbs 8.11, for wisdom is better than rubies, and all the things one may desire cannot be compared with her. Proverbs 8.12 and following, I, wisdom, dwell together with prudence. I possess knowledge and discretion. To fear the Lord is to hate evil. I hate pride and arrogance and evil behavior and perverse speech. Counsel and sound judgment are mine. I have understanding and power. Verse 13 says, wisdom hates the same things God hates, if you will. Wisdom will drive you towards God's ultimate plan and God's ultimate will for your life. We saw in Proverbs 1 that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. We said that knowledge, knowing, is one thing, but wisdom is the understanding, the application of that knowledge. Now, are you ready to get happy? Pay attention. This is important, Proverbs 9.10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. First, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, and now the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. But wait, there's more. <laughs> but wait, there's even more. Did you catch the latter part of that verse? The knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. you got to love that. Allow that to sink in for a minute. Knowledge of the Holy One. You understand what a privilege and honor that is? How many people are totally confused by God? How many people completely misunderstand God because they have no knowledge of Him? Many years back, we had a family in the church at the time. When, actually, they weren't in the church, but their wife came one day and got saved. And God really moved on her heart. Their family had lived in dysfunction for years. Father drank real heavy. He was gone a lot, truck driver. She got him to come to church. The kids had problems. They came in for counseling, and they were doing really well. He accepted the Lord and started turning his life around. I mean, the family was doing better than they ever had done in years. Several months later, he found out he had to have open-heart surgery. He got mad at God. All these years, I did what I wanted to do. Now I'm trying to serve God, and he gives me open-heart surgery? He had no knowledge of God. No matter what I said to him, he was mad. He went to the hospital to have the operation. I went there to meet them and be with them. And, and uh, while, just before I got there, I guess while he was waiting, you know, you get ready, get prepped, he got up, put his clothes on, and left. He's so mad about this. His wife talked to him to come back. He came back, had the operation. He stayed mad at God. He was mad, mad, no knowledge of the Holy One. A year later, he was dead. He had a chance for a new life, but he blamed God for everything wrong in his life. 
A couple years after that, his son killed himself. I mean, it's a tragic thing. Do you understand what a privilege it is to have the knowledge of the Holy One? At least some of it. The Word says you can have the knowledge of the Holy One. Proverbs 9, 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. To know and understand the holiness, character, and power of God. New Living Testament says knowledge of the Holy One results in good judgment. Living Bible says knowing God results in every other kind of understanding. And Jesus said this, John 17, 3, now, this is eternal life. You want to know what eternal life is? That they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. That's what eternal life is, to know God. But not when we get to heaven someday. Yes, more so then, but now. The only possible, this is only possible, we know, through the salvation of Jesus Christ. And once saved, you have the opportunity to develop a deep reverence for God and His holiness. Once you're saved, you have the opportunity to develop a reverence for God and God's holiness. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, the beginning of wisdom. And as I've said, beginning only means you can grow from there. The knowledge of God, the beginning of knowing Him, you can grow in more knowing Him. And Proverbs chapter 2 becomes a prescription then for God's wisdom. My son, if you receive my words and treasure my commands within you so that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding, yes, if you cry out for discernment, lift up your voice, that's prayer for understanding, if you seek her as silver and search for her as hidden treasures, then you'll understand the fear of the Lord and, and find the knowledge of God. To receive God's word, treasure, hide his commandments within you, incline your ear, you listen, you seek wisdom, you apply your heart to understanding. Lord, I, wanna, I don't want just head knowledge, I want to understand. To cry out for discernment to understand becomes a process to living in God's wisdom, developing your heart towards the things of God continually. And this is how we function in wisdom daily, not just when you cry out when you're in trouble. I am very proficient at crying out when there's trouble. I've got that part down. The Bible says we should cry out for discernment, to lift our voices to, Lord, I need to understand. Thank you. You promised me wisdom, and you promised me understanding, and you promised me knowledge of the Holy One because I'm running after you. What a promise. And this developing wisdom keeps us out of a lot of trouble, doesn't it? And Proverbs continues on here. Verse 6, for the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. My goodness, he stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk uprightly. He guards the path of justice, preserves the way of his saints, then you will understand righteousness and justice, equity, and every good path. When wisdom enters your heart and knowledge is pleasant to your soul, discretion will preserve you. Understanding will keep you to deliver you from the way of evil, from the man who speaks perverse things. I think we should pursue God's wisdom, don't you? And I'm so thankful that last week he said, if you want wisdom, ask, cry out for it. Just don't doubt that I'll give it to you. And you'll no longer be unstable in all your ways. You'll be walking in knowledge and understanding and wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One. When you've got knowledge of the Holy One, it helps your decisions. It makes, them, makes your decision-making so much easier because you know you've heard from God. What, what a promise, what a promise to the believer in Jesus Christ, the pursuit of God's wisdom. I'd like to invite the worship team to come forward. You know, don't check out, because on a daily basis, we are surrounded with the world's view 
of what is acceptable, the world's view of what is wise. The perverse ways of the world will erode your heart towards God and undermine godly wisdom in your life. Let's purpose to seek God first and walk in the promises of wisdom. Once again, if any of you lacks wisdom out of James 1, let him ask of God. He'll give it to you liberally, and he won't reproach, won't, won't beat you up for it. Let him ask in faith, but don't doubt. Because when you doubt, you're like a wave of the sea driven, tossing around like the wind. Last week, we spoke of the tragedy of doubt. Not seeking God's wisdom, doubting he will give it to you. I said, what a tragedy. What would your life be different without the tragedy of doubt? How different would your life be now if you pursued God's wisdom daily? How many miracles have we missed? How much of God's presence have we missed out on because we doubted God? Word of God, speak, would you pour down like rain, washing my eyes to see your majesty, to be still, and know that you're in this place. Let me stay, please, and rest in your holiness, and Lord, speak to me. If you need wisdom, ask him now. As we stand and worship God, begin your quest to pursue wisdom, not just now, but every day. So let's stand together this morning and worship our God and seek him for everything you need in your life. Let's stand and worship him this morning. Finding myself at a loss for words And the funny thing is, it's okay The last thing I need is to be heard But to hear what you would say Finding myself in the midst of you, beyond the music, beyond the noise, all that I need is to be.
greatly reward you. Father, thank you so much that uh, your word cries out to seek you for wisdom. As we cry out to you, you cry out, seek me, know me. This is eternal life to know the Father, to know the Son. Thank you so much, Lord, that we can walk in that. And Holy Spirit, deep within our hearts, draw us to hunger for wisdom to search out even more than anything else in this life. God's presence, God's holiness, God's wisdom, God's discernment, God's understanding. Thank you that it's available to us and we can walk in it every day. Thank you, Father, as your people go, that your angels encamp about them, protect them, keep them, watch over them. Thank you for a tremendous provision in their household, but in their hearts a hunger for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a blessed week. If you need prayer for anything, feel free to come forward. I'll be glad to pray with you. Have a blessed, blessed week.